Uh, Doc, first of all, I've seen you talk lately, recently. I was doing my research about you to make sure you're legit. Uh, you were talking about uh, hemoglobin A1C measurements and plant sterols and the effect that, that eating some plants, at least some of the time, can have on the health and viability of uh, erythrocytes, red blood cells, and how that can affect hemoglobin A1C measurements. Uh, and I've actually, about in about 5% of the carnivores in our community, we see that they get this falsely elevated A1C. Of, uh, and so I'll be using different numbers than you in, in, in the United States of 5.6 or lower is considered completely normal. Uh, but we'll see carnivores get a 5.7, 5.8, and they've been strict carnivore for six months or 12 months. And so we know that that's not coming from glycation events coming from their diet. There must be some other cause. Uh, tell me what you've learned about A1C, plant sterols, and how they can affect reticulocytes and erythrocytes. Well, first of all, let's have a think about what HbA1c is. Yes. So you've got a red blood cell, and it's swimming along in a soup. And when we talk about blood glucose, when you do the finger prick and you say, oh, there's glucose in my blood, you're physically talking about glucose molecules that are swimming along in this soup. So these red blood cells also in your blood, they're in contact with the glucose. Now, these glucose molecules can actually non-enzymatically, which means it's just a passive process, can attach together. And when the glucose attaches to the, to the red blood cell, we call that glycated. We call that HbA1c, glycated hemoglobin. Now, the more sugar that attaches, the bigger the number. So there's two factors that can actually increase the HbA1c. So factor number one is how much sugar is there? So that's why people with diabetes have greater HbA1c is because this soup, it's, it's a thick, viscous soup of sugar. It might as well be honey for blood. But number two, the duration of exposure. So if that those red blood cells are in that soup for longer, then there's going to be naturally more time for things to attach. And that's what happens in carnivores. You see, we talk about red blood cells like they've got a life of 120 days, but not in everybody. Some people's red blood cells just aren't that healthy. They don't live as long. They, they suffer more oxidation stress. They're not as resilient. They're not as deformable. The myriad of reasons why, but they're if their red blood cells are not lasting for very long, then what will actually happen is you'll get an artificially low HbA1c reading. So people who are sick, I'll often see people with an HbA1c of 4.5 or something like that, and I'm just saying, uh-uh, that's not real. You're, there's, We've got to look at a reason why are your red blood cells turning over excessively. But on carnivores, they put their body into a physiological state where the red blood cells can actually live for longer. Their survivability is improved. And in that situation, what actually happens is that because they're in contact with the sugar for longer, they're able to actually have an elevated HbA1c. And fortunately, there is a way we can actually assess for this in the blood. So we've got a, when we do a full blood count, we get hemoglobin, you know, red cell counts on and so forth. And we can also get, although we don't always ask for it, something called reticulocytes. Now, a reticulocyte is a new red blood cell. Now, I'd call it a baby red blood cell, but they're actually bigger. Yep. So we'll go with a new red blood cell. And the idea is that if you're in a steady state, if, you're, if your red cell count is stable between two blood tests, then the rate of red cell blood cell production should be a pretty good surrogate marker, a proxy marker for the rate of red blood cell destruction or turnover. So what we can actually see is that in carnivores, their blood cell now amount is staying stable, their reticulocyte, their new red blood cells are going down, and at the same time, their HFbA1c is going up. So that gives us an insight that the increased HbA1c is actually a consequence of improved red blood cell survivability. So how on God's green earth does this come about? So we've heard of cholesterol, this molecule which is absolutely essential for life, but have you heard of fake plant, fraudulent cholesterol, imposter cholesterol, phytosterol? So this is what's in seed oils and plant foods, and this is molecularly very, very similar to actual real cholesterol. It's just got a bit of a tweaking on molecular side chains. 
and it can actually be absorbed in small quantities by the body, but because it is different, it doesn't have the same biological function. And it gets incorporated into red blood cells, which, by the way, the highest concentration of cholesterol in any cell membrane in the body is in red blood cells, is in red blood cells. So red blood cells take it up. And if red blood cells take up this fake plant cholesterol because you're consuming too many plant, you know, seed oils, so on and so forth, it actually damages them. There's clear evidence, and this has been studied, that when you increase the phytosterol content of red blood cells, they become fragile less deformable, they turn over quicker. So that's why if you have a diet high in seed oils, you could actually see a paradoxical lowering of your HbA1c. Now, I know not part of your question here, but just while we're talking about, so if you have a HbA1c, what do we do? Well, I, I would recommend cross-referencing it with what I consider to be the gold standard for glucose measurement, glycemic assessment, which is a 24 hour or a continuous glucose monitor. And they are absolutely beautiful. So that's real time measurement, you know, wirelessly going straight to your phone. You'll see in real time, it's like what we call the election night worm, you know, which political party is winning in that seat. You actually see your sugar trace in response to whatever foods you're eating. And if you've got great glycemic control, you will see this. Just a couple of points though, that is often overlooked on continuous glucose monitors, they do not measure the concentration of glucose in the blood. So, and this is often people will say, oh, you know, my sugar goes high, I have a shower, when I exercise, my sugar's going way up. And it's like, uh-uh, your sugar's not going way up. Let me explain what's going on. So you've got the little probe from the 24 hour monitor and that sits in what we call interstitial fluid, not exactly in the blood. So what happens is the blood is flowing around and it's delivering glucose molecules. And some of those glucose molecules are escaping and going into the interstitial fluid. So the interstitial fluid reading of glucose is dependent also on two factors. One of them is the concentration of glucose. The other one is the speed of blood flow. The greater the blood flow, the greater the delivery of glucose to that sensor, which is why if you have a hot shower, you vasodilate, you open up your blood vessels, you increase the blood flow, it looks like you're getting a spike in sugar. You're getting a spike in blood flow. Same when you exercise, you're increasing your circulation, you're increasing the delivery of glucose to the sensor. And that's why there's not always a direct one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between the finger prick blood glucose, which is more accurate, and the continuous glucose monitor. But the mm -hmm. continuous glucose monitor will tell you if you've got stable sugars. And if you've got stable sugars, you're sitting fairly pretty. Yeah, I totally agree. And there's a long list of things that can falsely lead to an elevated A1C. There's a, there's a long list of things that can lead to a falsely mm -hmm. depressed or lowered A1C. Uh, chronic alcohol intake can actually give you a falsely low. A1C, there's a long list that anybody can look up. And so when I see a carnivore, uh, and I don't, I don't see this in, in people eating a uh, ketogenic diet. It's really only in carnivores or, or ketivores who are just almost carnivore, 95%. But I'll check a, either a fructosamine or a glycated albumin. And invariably, even though the A1C is a little bit elevated in these carnivores, the fructosamine or the glycated albumin is stone cold normal which I think is another good way. And I love your reticulocytes. That's an excellent way of looking at this to see how many new uh, young blood cells are out there in the circulation. Why are you having to create so many of those? Well, it's because the degraded red blood cells that, that have the plant sterols, they're being uh, pre pre preferentially broken down and destroyed by the spleen and other, other parts of the body because they're improperly made. I think that's an excellent insight. Um, well, just, just one thing there, Ken, though, just on fructosamine. So fructosamine is analogous to HbA1c in that there's a protein called albumin, or right. albumin, as we might say in, down under right. from the antiquity. Albumin, yes, yes. albumin. Now, um, now, albumin is what we call a negative acute phase reactant. Yes. So now what does that even mean? So basically, in a normal existence, <clears throat> healthy existence, our liver produces lots of proteins, which is good because we need proteins to live. 
But when we're sick, we have other proteins that the liver produces, like C-reactive protein, that's an inflammatory protein. But there's a finite synthetic capacity in the liver. It can't just say, oh, I'm going to produce more CRP now and not subtract away from something else. So your albumin production will actually reduce when you're actually inflamed and chronically inflamed. And the, the change in albumin synthesis uh, rate can actually impact on your fructosamine as well. So fructosamine is not uh, not removed from having extraneous factors that can impact it sure. in the same way that HbA1c can. So, sure. when, yeah, so absolutely, I, I do use fructosamine from time to time, but I, I still always come back to the continuous glucose monitor. I love that. Yeah, 24-hour continuous glucose monitor, it's hard to beat. Now, I always love to point this out. <clears throat> because there's a few people in the carnivore community now calling it animal-based diet who eat hundreds of grams of, of carbohydrates a day in the form of fruit and honey. And I actually had a discussion with one of these folks, we won't name any names, but he and I are good friends. But he said uh, that, that the hemoglobin A1C and fructosamine test, they, they absolutely test for fructose glycation as well as glucose glycation. And I was like, I don't think so, my friend. You maybe need to look into that. And so uh, let's be very clear. Even though fruk is in the name, it only checks for glucose glycation. It does not monitor. And, and here's the other problem with fructose is that the glycation potential of fructose is seven to 10 times greater than that of glucose. Exactly right. And so these people who are eating lots of fruit and honey are getting a gigantic amount of fructation or fructose glycation that no test at the doctor's office can detect. And so I always like to make that point because it's confusing for, for the layman. Say, well, it's got, it says fructose amine. It's got to measure fructose. No, it doesn't. And even, and don't feel bad if you're a layman and you thought that because some doctors don't know that, that it only checks for glucose glycation as does the glycated albumin. They do not check for fructose glycation. And so that's very important for people to understand. Now, are you a big fruit and honey eater as well? Or do you believe that's probably not the best choice? Look, for me, I don't think it's the best choice. But I'm also, I don't want to be dogmatic about this. So this whole thing about carnivore, it's turned into a bit of a dogma and ideology, if you will. Yes. Yeah, and my personal belief is that people who are metabolically healthy probably can tolerate certain amounts of sugar. And I yep. have a sneaking suspicion, which I think will be borne out in future, that a lot of these plant food intolerances that we're actually seeing, that we didn't see in generations gone by, is actually a direct consequence of alterations to the way food is produced. Namely, to a lesser extent, nutrient deficient, and more significantly, pesticide adulteration. So. In Australia, so here's a pop quiz here for you. So I'm a farmer. I'm growing wheat in Australia. I'm, uh, I want to turn it into bread in the future. How many days before I harvest that wheat am I allowed to spray it with Roundup? Zero. I don't know what the regulation is in Australia. Six days. Hmm. And, okay, so and if I spray a crop with Roundup, um, we, we often do it while it's growing. So the, the whole thing about GMO modified organisms is not worried about the genetics of it. It's designed to make it resistant to weed killers so we can spray the crap out of them with yep. weed killers so that only one thing grows. That's the whole point of a monocrop. And now, the reason you... that they would spray it six days before harvest, a lot of people don't know this, Dr. Mason, is that desiccates, that dries the crop out so that it's easier to harvest. Exactly. It may it allows for a much more rapid harvest. But often they're, they're also they're not just spraying it on, on at the end. They're also spraying on it when it's rapidly growing. Now, what do grains do when they're rapidly growing? They take everything up from their environment. So when you've got a crop that's been sprayed by pesticide, it is actually internalized. You cannot break it down by cooking. You cannot wash it off. The rate of pesticide exposure is increasing exponentially. So a World Health Organization report calculating the worldwide per capita for every single person in the world, use of pesticides has estimated that in the last 30 years, there's been 11 kilograms of Roundup applied to our food for every person on earth. And 70% of that has been applied in the last 10 years. I mean, this is, and that's just one single pesticide. You know, there's, there's numerous, Version. So this whole thing about 
and the pesticides has incredibly wide ranging. I know we probably didn't want to get too much into the weeds on this kind oh, of topic today, but I mean, we have to understand that what this does is it destroys the soil. So the the all the the fungal elements and all these uh, protist elements, the, the things that are necessary for soil structure are destroyed. Now, sure, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but where does the nutrition? How do we release the nutrients? from the sand and the stone and the clay from the soil. It's with these complex ecological, biological yep. forms. And the pesticides just demolish that, which is why when we perform nutrient analysis on fruits and vegetables today compared to earlier, many nutrients are down by at least half, you know, often up to three quarters. Yep. And a lot of the data that I've been able to get is still 20, 30 years old, which doesn't incorporate the recent massive increases in fertilised use. So when I come back and say, look, this is not an ideology about carnivore plant foods versus, you know, so on and so forth, we have to understand that our very food systems are not the same. So sure, if you want to eat plant foods, and they agree with you and you're not celiac and you're not reacting to gluten, so on and so forth, then there's no ideological reason why you ought not do that. But I would strongly encourage you to make sure that it is organic. And even if you're eating organic foods, that doesn't completely eliminate your exposure to pesticides, but it has been proven by research to reduce it significantly. Yep, I totally agree. And uh, in many cases, I've actually, I've read all the studies you've read about the decrease in the nutrition in uh, plants, in grains and in actual vegetables as well. And in many cases, when the, when the researchers look at the soil itself and do chemical analysis, the, the vitamins and minerals are in the soil, yes, <clears> but it's just not all the bacteria and all the fungus. That's that, that beautiful, uh, currently indescribable, ununderstandable food, that soil web of life, that's how the, the the minerals get into the vegetables of the wheat. And when you destroy that with fungicide, pesticide, herbicide, it might be in the dirt, but it's not gonna get into the into the plants. And that's a huge problem, that's a huge deal. And I love it that you know that about uh, about uh, raising crops. That's, that's good information. Most people don't wear, uh, not aware of that.